morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a few new faces today in the crowd, and so if you are new to our program, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through just awesome virtual broadcasts with some of the coolest people and places on this planet. And February is a really special month for us. Since we were founded back in 2015, we have kicked out all the men all month long in commemoration of February 11th, the International Day for Women and Girls in STEM, to bring in like 50, 60 amazing women in science and exploration from across this planet. Today is going to be a lot of fun. Later on today, we've got Natalie Ouellette with the James Webb Space Telescope and Sylvia Earle, one of the all-time icons of ocean exploration. So it's going to be a really exciting day. But today, to kick off the, the festivities, we are joined by one of my favorite scientists and explorers that we bring on the program, and that is Galen Rosenwax. She is an ocean explorer. She picked up diving at 14 years old. She has explored all the oceans of the world. She's going to talk to us today about sperm whales one of the most amazing creatures on this planet. I'm so, so excited to literally and figuratively dive in with you all today. And without further ado, Galen, thank you so much for joining us and take us away. All right. Thank you for having me. Um, very excited to be here. So can you see my screen, my slides? We sure can. It's up and ready to go. Okay. Awesome. All right. So this is a, uh, always a little challenging. Um, technically. Um, anyway, thank you so much for joining me this morning. I'm going to take you guys on a little bit of a journey. This is like a little sneak peek. We're going to talk mostly about sperm whales, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a few of my other favorite projects and sort of build up to a little bit of how I got to be working on sperm whales right now. Um, so here's just a quick map. I love maps. I think most explorers do um, of some of the places that I've been on expeditions. And I wish we had days and days and days that we could talk about. But in reality, we're going to talk just about a few different spots um, here. Um, but mostly we're going to be in Dominica down here in the Caribbean. Um, but I started my career working in the Antarctic. And I always just love to show some pictures from there. Because really, to get to where I've been today, it took a lot of hard work and dedication and a lot of different expeditions along the way to build up the skill set that I needed to do my current project. But here I am in front of some icebergs in Antarctica. I was a low man on the totem pole on this expedition, so I was cleaning a lot of nets quite frequently and collecting organisms like krill and copepods because we were looking at food chain issues and what was going on and where these krill were going in the winter. And krill are the most important species in the Antarctic. So really understanding how everything was linked together in this environment. And that was really the founding um, information that I needed and like the, you know, the foundation that I needed for the rest of my career as I was like looking at all of the different questions I was going to ask in all of my different projects. But it was a really cool project. So there's an Adelie penguin and an elephant seal. The one day we got off the ship, I was on that ship for two months. So it was my longest expedition still to date. Um, but it was a really wonderful expedition and really taught me everything about how to do science in the field, how to be ready to be in the field for so long, how to deal with extreme cold. Um, and then, of course, all of the science that we learned and all of the breakthroughs that we were making were just so exciting. So I knew I was in the right place. Then I switched gears and I started studying my favorite fish in the ocean, the bluefin tuna. Um, and I just always can't give a talk without talking about bluefin. And again, I was in cold water, but this time I was fishing. I love to fish. I don't know if anybody out there loves to fish too. Um, but I think that it's such a great way to engage with the ocean and find out what's there. Um, it's just such a mysterious place, the ocean and fishing. We never know what we're going to catch. But here we were catching bluefin and we were bringing them on board in order to tag them to learn about where they were going in the ocean. So here's a giant bluefin. Bluefin get really big. There's a theme to most of my work and it's all really big things or really tiny things. So in the Antarctic, I was studying krill, which are like the tiniest things on the planet. And now here I was studying one of the largest fish on the planet. They get over 1500 pounds, so really big fish. They also go everywhere in the ocean. So another theme is like migratory fish and migratory patterns and how these fish and animals are using the ocean and what's going on in the ocean around them. So here we're putting an internal tag inside the tuna and it's going to measure body temperature and um, where it's going. And then we're going to be able to learn a ton about the ocean and the ocean surrounding the fish and what these fish are doing in their life, where they're going to eat, where they're going to spawn and all kinds of neat stuff about their life history. Then I switched gears a little bit and I went back up to the Arctic and I actually love, this is sort of my mantra for life. And it's, it says real courage is moving forward when the outcome is uncertain. 
And while a fortune cookie may not be where we should be always getting our career and life advice, I do think that this is a really good mantra to have because we always need to sort of look ahead and take those risks and then we'll have tremendous reward. Um, and so here I am in the Arctic, um, looking again at a big ecosystem project. I spent over a month on this ship on two different occasions, and we, here we are parked in the ice. Science is so fun that like I get to do all of these cool projects and get to put them all together and look at the big picture of what's going on on our planet. So here we are moving through some ice. Nothing is cooler than being on a ship moving through a solid, pla a solid, what seems like a solid surface. Um, and so sea ice is just incredibly beautiful. And here I am actually off the ship, holding up the ship because I am that strong. And for anybody interested in the Arctic and Arctic science, I made an entire web series um, on this expedition that you can check out online. Um, I wish we could just watch it together, um, but unfortunately we don't have time. Um, but it's a six part series all about the science that we were doing, all about ecosystem science up in the Arctic and what's happening with climate change and the changes in sea ice. We also get to see lots of cool critters. And this sort of began my foray into wildlife photography, which you'll see is a theme um, starting very soon. Um, but mostly we were looking at big ship science. Um, so look, deploying all kinds of big instruments to learn about the ocean. So things like a multi-core, which, which um, sample the bottom of the ocean, um, fending off things while we're collecting water samples um, to learn about the water column, to really get a whole picture of what's going on. And this is so important with everything that we do in the ocean, because we're not just looking at an animal when we're taking wildlife pictures. We're looking at how that, and I'm looking at how that animal is fitting into an ecosystem, how it's using that water, why it's using that water, why it's where it is. Um, and just, again, incredible sea ice in the Northwest Passages of the Canadian Arctic. Newly forming ice. Sea ice is so cool. Um, this looks like, it's called pancake ice. I think it looks like scalloped potatoes. Um, but then I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little bit more about wildlife photography. And then we're going to get into sperm whales. So here's a picture of a sea otter. And when I started taking pictures like the ones of the walruses and then sea otters and sea lions, I said, wow, this is so cool. I'm capturing all of this really cool behavior as a photographer. So I'm a scientist looking at these behaviors, but I want to capture it. And then I want to share it with the world. Then after the sea lions and all of the other things, wherever I'm going, I have a camera in my hand and it's really become my main tool for communication. Um, but then I got in this big predator kick. And so I got in the water with big great white sharks because I had always been fascinated with sharks as I think so many of us are, um, you know, so just really big, beautiful animals. This was in Guadalupe, Mexico. Um, just incredible to be in the water with a predator like a shark. And you'll see that they're very different than the predators like a sperm whale, which are also one of the large, which are the largest predator on the planet. Um, hammerhead sharks, this one actually photobombed me. I had no idea it was behind me. My friend took a picture and I, all of a sudden I turned around, I was like, oh, there's this hammerhead. Pretty cool. Um, but being able to be in the water and interact with these animals has given me a greatest, greater appreciation for this current project I'm working on um, about sperm whales. So here I am swimming next to a large female sperm whale in Dominica in the Eastern Caribbean, where I pointed out on the map earlier. And this project has really taken over my life. And it started out as a smaller project. I was going to make a film about a young sperm whale that I interacted with when I was a toddler. And he had stranded himself on the beaches of Long Island. And my mom took us, they brought him into, into captivity where they kept him in captivity for nine days. And people worked on this baby whale and they figured out he had pneumonia. And when they figured out he had pneumonia, they actually were able to give him antibiotics. And the antibiotics then got him well and they were able to set him free. So flash forward a few decades later, and I was talking to a gentleman that I happened to meet, and he was like, I work on sperm whales. And I said, well, it's so funny that you say that. I've always wanted to do this project on sperm whales, where I looked at the story of this young whale who was a five or six-year-old male sperm whale. So about 24 feet in length, so a big animal that was in captivity. And I always wanted to know where he should have been back when he was in captivity then, when I was a little girl, and where he would be now as a, say, 40-plus-year-old 
whale, a full grown male sperm whale. So I embarked on this project now a number of years ago to really reconnect with these animals, to understand about their lifestyles. So a little bit about sperm whales. They're the largest tooth predator on the planet. So they, like a shark, is a predator and they eat fish. Sperm whales eat mostly giant squid and they swim to extreme depths. They're the best free diver on the planet because unlike sharks, they're mammals and mammals like us breathe air. So really important. So that what they have, though, is this incredible adaptation to being able to dive to extreme depths over a thousand meters, over 3000 feet quite frequently and they can hold their breath for over 45 minutes. So it's incredible. It's an incredible feat if you think about it. I mean, how long can we hold our breath? Like for me, I can hold my breath for four minutes and I think it's absolutely amazing. But 45 minutes down exploring. So we just see a glimmer of their life while they're on the surface, sort of taking these recovery breaths to before they're going to go back and hunt. But so they're the largest predator on the planet. They eat giant squid. They also have the largest brain on the planet. And so you'll see that for me, that's one of the biggest differences with them as a predator versus a shark is that they have so much intelligence. So I'm going to show you some of these photos. And here's a little video, a little drone footage that I took um, on one of our expeditions, just so you can see what they look like above as they're swimming. And here I am for scale. I'm swimming up next to the whale. So this is a smaller female whale in Dominica. We have mostly female whales um, and they're residents of Dominica and they're extremely playful. So the whales of Dominica are mostly in family groups. They stay with their families their entire lives, the females, and the males will leave when they're adolescents. So when they're like teenagers and they say, later on, mom, I'm gonna go explore the ocean. Um, and they go and they head into northern latitudes and they form these other groups to where sometimes you see multiple male whales together. But when Feisty, the young whale I saw, was only five or six years old, he still very, very much should have been with his family. And you see these younger male whales in with their moms and their grandmothers and their sisters and their cousins. And it's pretty phenomenal. So the females only reach around 30 feet and the males will get over 60 feet. So much bigger. So feisty, that young whale I would have seen would be about a 60 foot male today. And he still could be roaming the ocean because they live to over 70 years. And they really live a very similar life history to people. So they reach maturity when they're in their teens. So when they're teenagers, and then they, you know, start having babies when they're around like 20 years old, much like many people or certainly people can. I know we now wait a little bit later in life, but, and then they, they live until they're 70 plus years old. So very much like a human lifestyle, but they're extremely playful in the water. And I've been so lucky to spend so many days in them. So here there's th actually three whales in this picture and they're pirouetting around each other and dancing around each other and just going upside down and backwards. And it's pretty special. Here's a pregnant female that I was in the water with. She was one of my favorite whales that I've interacted with. She had a large scar underneath her eye so I could always tell who she was on her other side is where the scar is. And it was just incredible to spend so much time with her. But you can see their eye just sort of penetrates into your soul. And it just seems that they're like looking at you in such a different way than any other animal that I've ever been in the water with before. And they're very interactive, which is super special. Here, like I was saying, they're matrilineal and they stay with their family groups, the females, for generations. So here there's actually three generations of whales. So the closest whale to us with her mouth wide open is a baby whale. Um, she's about a year old. Her name is Ariel. These whales are very well studied by the Dominican Sperm Whale Project. And I know Shane Garo is one of the chief scientist on that project. And he does a lot of talks for exploring by the seat of your pants. And I highly recommend tuning into one of his um, if you have a chance, because he'll tell you way more about sperm whale, wit, sperm whale cultures and their language. Um, and I'm really talking about my observations of them. But so here you've got the baby whale, the mom, her name is Soursop, and then the grandmother are fruit salad. So they get these silly names, but they're all in a family group and they're in unit A. Um, and they all have distinct language and culture. And here you can see the baby is copying the mom and the grandma I'm learning this behavior as they're clicking on us. So they're actually clicking on us 
using their sonar and echolocation to get a picture of who we are. That's how they're sort of analyzing us. Do we want to be in the water with these people? And so you feel their clicks on you and it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and then they're also communicating so that they often dive in unison and it's pretty awesome to watch them dive. And so here's another adult and a baby as they're diving down. Another really cool thing is that oftentimes the babies won't, aren't, can't dive as deep as the moms. So they'll stay on the surface and, or they'll stay a little bit deeper, but I've had some incredible interactions with babies on the surface where like we're babysitting the whale. The mom somehow knows that as people we're totally okay. And they like size us up a few times in the water. And then we'll be babysitting one of these babies for, you know, an hour while the mom goes and hunts. And then you can't always hear it, but the baby must hear the mom and she beelines it and reunites with the mom and you see them together on the surface. So it's pretty neat um, to see. Um, and here again, three generations of whales, just so playful and just to be in the water. And now, so this was a couple of years ago and I've subsequently gone back to Dominica a number of times and now watch this baby grow up. And it's so special to be able to identify them and be in the water with them um, and really to connect um, with these incredible animals. And also note that they only have teeth on their bottom jaw, which is really cool. And they have these like cool sockets that they fit into. Um, but here I'm going to show you a quick video, a little video of one of my favorite interactions that I had with a whale. So here is um, a whale. Her name, she was part of a group called the Strangers. They didn't have names um yet but she was so interactive she was a pregnant female so while i haven't seen her baby she her baby would now be over a year old but she was about ready to have this young calf but she was extraordinarily playful so she had checked us out on our first dive and then we went back in the water with her and then she spent half an hour where literally her eye and my eye met and we just had this like total mind meld and she wouldn't let me out of her sight. She would go vertical and go to sleep. And it was just so incredibly special. And she was just checking me out. We was like we were having a conversation in the water. And I've never been in the water with another animal that's like that. But with sperm whales, it's extremely special. So I'm hoping this video plays. Um, and I'm just going to like let you watch it. It's just a minute long. So that still is one of my absolute favorite interactions that I've ever had with a sperm whale in the water. And it was one of my first interactions um, that I had on our second expedition. Um, our first our first expedition, we didn't have very much luck. One thing with wildlife photography is, you, or filmmaking, you never know uh, how the animals are going to cooperate and if you're actually going to see any. Um, but she was extremely special. So this is one of the photographs that I made on that interaction. Um, and being able to be in the water, as you can see, at one point I was almost in her mouth and I was backing away. It felt like she just wanted me to like give her a hug. But of course, we don't touch wildlife. Um, so I was often swimming backwards from her. Um, but here you can see looking down into her mouth as one of the times that she went vertical and sort of was like sleeping in front of me and clicking on me. So in that video, you heard both her clicks and then also the shutter of my camera. So there was those were the two sounds that you were hearing in addition to the music. But as I was saying here, you can see here are her bottom teeth, um, which are pretty awesome. And then you can see these sockets are where her teeth actually fit into when she closes her mouth. So it's also a pretty neat adaptation that they have um, that makes them very unique amongst whales. But you can also see here um, there are some scars, some battle wounds from, you know, some squid tentacles when she was hunting down at the, down below. 
But looking into a sperm whale's eye, there is nothing more special. They literally just penetrate into your soul. And this one really was just so expressive. And the other thing about sperm whales is you really can recognize them, much like we see each other or you can tell your dogs apart from other dogs. Like I have a black lab and a yellow lab and, you know, everybody's like, oh, well, all labs look alike. But I could tell my two, you know, apart from, you know, a hundred labs if they were in a room. And it's very similar with sperm whales. Not only are they distinct because they have different fluke shapes, which is how the scientists identify them. But actually when you spend a lot of time in the water with them, you can actually tell them apart by looking in their eyes and just from some distinct markings and also their behaviors, which was pretty cool. One thing about sperm whales too, is that they poop a lot. And I always think these are funny, but this is a series of pictures where one of our expeditions, we literally got pooped on all the time. Now, sperm whale poop is actually extremely important for the ecosystem. So it's one of the ways that sperm whales link the bottom of the ocean, the depths of the ocean where they're hunting to the surface. So they're getting all of these nutrients from the giant squid and the other squid and fish that they're eating down at depth then they're processing it through their bodies. And then when they come up to the surface and poop, they're bringing all of those nutrients up to the surface, creating, you know, a bloom of life and really adding all of those nutrients. So it's kind of an interesting nutrient cycle that they're helping be a part of. Now, as someone who's now spent time in the water with a lot of poop, it smells terrible. And you certainly want to make sure that your mouth is closed, um, speaking from experience. But it's also pretty neat to be part of this sort of circle. And you can oftentimes find the beaks of the squid that they're eating in their poop. Um, and it's pretty cool. So while pooping pictures may not be what you expected to see today, um, I always have to include them. Um, but so here's a cloud of poop before she would dive. She also does poop right before she dives. So she would kind of pause, do this roll. And then, you know, you'd be like, oh, I'm going to take all these great pictures. And then you'd be in this cloud of poop. Then she would take a few breaths and then she would disappear into the depths. Um, but it's pretty, it's a very important part of the ecosystem and the world's ocean ecosystems to link all of these nutrients together. So I'm going to end there with one of my favorite pictures of um, a whale looking at me. And I would love to take some questions um, because sperm whales are awesome. You can stay tuned. I'm going to, um, this film should be out soon, um, which is really exciting to see it all coming together where we'll share some of the footage and more about the story and the connection of my connection to sperm whales. And also my mom plays a role in the film too. So it's pretty awesome. <laughs> Spoilers, so, spoilers. Uh, yeah. Okay. Galen, that was fantastic. What a beautiful yeah, program. You know. Come on, screen share. Great. Um, so we are going to go to Q&A soon. What I forgot to mention at the top of the broadcast is we are going to do a little Kahoot quiz. Galen, I think this might be your first Kahoot quiz with us, but we've been doing these it interactive, four-question, kind of fun, exciting, interactive programs uh, before we dive with Q&A. So if people have this open in another tab on your computer, I know we've got Miss Turney's class joining us, Miss Ives class, Miss Pauling's class on YouTube. We've got a bunch of groups live with us as well. I'm going to bring that up on the screen. And Galen, you can help us in the final second that each of these uh, questions that are going to come up. Now, kids aren't going to win anything with this, but they are going to win both of our everlasting respect if they take part and they win today. And of course, if you don't have Kahoot uh, queued up on your computer, I know I forgot to mention it at the top, feel free to play along with the questions in your class. And then I'm so excited for your questions. Galen, we've got groups in uh, St. Louis, in Hillsdale, New Jersey, in Toronto today, Sudbury. We've got a group in Belgium joining us live on camera. Um, Awesome. All right. So guys, feel free to sign in. A lot of horses and ponies right now, which is great. The faster you answer, the more points you get. Oh, I love and these names. This is I know. They're great. Eh? They're they <laughs> auto-generated. Feel free to keep joining in. We're going to start our first question in just a second. All right. How big are sperm whales anyhow? Now, Gail did mention uh, a length of one at one point during the broadcast. 20 feet, 40 feet, over 50 feet, or 100 feet. What do we think? 16 answers so far. 10 more seconds coming in. Da, 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 da. Five more seconds, guys. Oh, there's 40 of you now almost. That's exciting. Way to go. Okay. Again, faster you answer, more points you get. Let's see what people got. So tw most of you got this right. They can get a little longer than 50 feet. I wanted to keep it as, as concrete as possible, so that's great. Let's see what our leaderboard is. All right. Blue Lamb has got the lead, Galen. I mean, that's pretty exciting. I'm, I'm having fun. Second question coming up, where was Galen for the whales? Where were we this whole time? 
I mean, it was so exciting. We kept hearing about all these things. She did mention it numerous times where she was in the world. Brazil, Dominican Republic, Dominica, Madagascar. Hmm, 60, 60 years of our, wow, that's very exciting. Okay, I'm going to get the game pin off the screen. You guys are in. How was Brazil? No, it's not Brazil. <laughs> where were we, 64? Most of you got that right. Most people were paying attention. A few of you tripped up by Dominican Republic. They're close, not quite the same. Very cool, okay. Does Blue Mama keep the lead? No, Golden Panther. Okay. By the way, if you are these people, let us know in the chat. We'd love to hear who in the class is uh, who. What on earth is going on here? So I will admit this is my favorite thing in all of nature. Galen, you can tell me later if you've experienced this live. Like, this is the thing that I most want to see in the ocean <laughs> of my life. Because it's the most surreal thing. The first time I saw a picture of it, like National Geographic, my mind was blown. So is it they're hunting, sleeping, courting each other, or about to be beamed up to the mothership? What do we think? Sleeping. Yes. Galen, have you seen this? Have you been to the water? Where they're all I like, have. Oh. Yes. Yes. On our last expedition, oh. we saw many, many sleeping whales, and it was incredible. I mean, I'm so excited for you and super jealous all at the same time. So I, that's awesome. On the three and takes lead barely over Smooth Octopus. Oh, I'm pressing the end broadcast button rather than the next button because I am tired today. Don't do that. True or false? Sperm whales are the coolest. This is a very easy answer. You only have 10 seconds for this. Uh, no pressure at all. And if you get this wrong, you're instantly, you're void. You're, you're void from the, the, the quiz. All right, what's our answer? 64. Three of you are like, no, I want to know what they thought. Yeah, Galen. I, I need to know why you don't think sperm whales are the coolest. What do you <laughs> yeah. think are the coolest if sperm whales are not? They are the coolest. Whales. We talked about a lot of animals at the beginning of this, probably sperm whales beat them all. Okay, here's our leaderboard. And then we are going to go to Mr. Mark Brooks' class in Sudbury for our first question in just a minute. Our winner, barely over Honest Raven, is da -da -da, Smooth Octopus. If you are Smooth Octopus, please tell us who you are in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Galen, your first good quiz. Uh, all right, Mr. Marker's class, come on in and take us away with a question. Hi, guys. Hi, Galen. Thanks so much for your presentation. I've got Landon here, and he wants to know. Why did you pick sperm whales when you can, you nope. can do sharks? And why do sperm whales not eat you? Why do they not eat you, and why did you pick them, Galen? <laughs> well... I pick sperm whales because, well, I think they're the coolest. But no, I um, because I had this personal connection and I saw a sperm whale when I was just around two years old, I really wanted to learn more about them and I wanted to get in the water with them. So I think sperm whales and sharks are both probably equally cool. Um, and I've worked on both. But for right now, sperm whales are my main focus. But I think sharks will come back in because, you know, they're both really cool animals. Well, there are many different types of sharks and they're all really cool. And I think pretty much everything in the ocean is really cool. So one's not really better than the other. Um, but I uh, and then uh, now I forgot the second part of the question because I got so. Yeah. Like <laughs> why don't they eat you? So you're sitting beside them. So, yeah. So. Well, I don't exactly know why, because I can't get inside the brain of a sperm whale, but no sperm whale has, to my knowledge, ever hurt a swimmer in the water with them. And I think it's because they're so smart, right? They've got these huge brains. And um, and so I think that it's their decision not to eat me, right? If they want to eat me, they certainly could. They are certainly big enough, and they certainly have big enough teeth. And but they don't, they really are just curious and pretty gentle in the water with them. I've never had an interaction with them that I've been worried at all. Um, sometimes they get very playful, especially the young ones, and they act kind of like a puppy and they like come up to you and like they want to, like, you know, it feels like they just want to like snuggle you. And obviously, we just kind of swim backwards and stay away from them um, as best as we can because we don't want to touch them. But they, they never have been aggressive. Um, and I can't really answer why that is other than the fact that they probably are just so smart that they know that we're not their food and they would much rather eat a giant squid. Great answer. All right. I'm Natasha joining us in Belgium. We don't get people from Belgium very often. If you want to come on in and share a question with us, go for it. Hi. Yes, good afternoon. So that was an amazing presentation. And we were wondering how you can explain about all those different languages. I mean, it's one species and still they've got different languages. 
Yes. Well, I mean, it's similar to people, right? So they have individual cultures um, and different languages. The different families have different codas that they use to communicate and identify themselves. So it's sort of the same as we would say, hey, my name is Galen and your name's Natasha. So we would, you know, and we would say, oh, and I'm Galen from New York. And you would be, I'm Natasha from Belgium. And you know, why they have them, I don't, you know, it's the same as we do. It's just to identify themselves as different families and as different clans. Sometimes they interact with each other. So it seems like they're having a conversation. Now, there's a big project going on right now um, that I'm not a part of um, to try to decipher these languages further. Um, but it definitely seems like not only are they communicating and like have different distinct ways of identifying themselves as families and as individuals, but then they also have ways of communicating amongst themselves to say, hey, it's time to, you know, where are you, baby? I want you need to come back to, to you know, mom to, right now if you've wandered off or, you know, let's go hunting or something like that. Um, I don't know that we'll ever like fully understand it, to be honest with you. And I think that, you know, one thing that I do feel pretty strongly about is the fact that we're putting sort of like our whatever we think that they should be talking about onto them if we're trying to decipher a language. And it could be something like the water is, you know, like something that we can't even remotely fathom because we're not perceiving the ocean in the same way they are. But it's pretty neat. And it's just different cultures because they're big mammals, just like we are. They're very similar to elephants as well. They're family units and how they interact um, and communicate. So, yeah, I mean, really, they're probably a lot smarter than us. It's, it's really, I mean, I love this sort of thing because when it comes to animal cultures, there's not many that we can sort of, you know, concretely say, wow, they're very different from one another. So other great apes like us, gorillas, chimps, I mean, very distinct cultures in different groups. Whales, we see this around the globe. And it's so special to be able to see that like, wow, a whole different hunting technique or a whole different way of working together or bigger groups yeah. or smaller groups. or I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing stuff. And, and Absolutely. Really yeah, that. no. And to watch them interact and to watch them interact as families has just been so incredibly special. Um, because really it's, it's nothing I've ever experienced before in the wild, you know, and I think it just, it's mind blowing. Yeah. I encourage everyone in their lives. If you get the chance to learn how to scuba dive, you can do it as young as eight years old. You can start on the path and then 70% of the world is open to you. So you can have a life like Galen has, which is pretty special. So get out there. Paddy Bubble Maker is the name of the course. I'll put that up for people in the, the registration at the end of the broadcast. But for now, let's head to Miss Turney's class. Our second graders are Northside Community School in St. Louis. They've got a whole whack of questions. Wow. Um, Alia is curious about the size of baby sperm whales. How big are they? <laughs> so... Baby sperm whales are actually quite large. So they weigh about a ton. So 2000 pounds when they're born and they range in size from 11 to 16 feet. So they're still a big animal. You know, they're sort of like the size of a small great white shark right when they're born. Um, so yeah, so, or actually a pretty big great white shark, but um, they're really big. Yeah, so they're, they're significantly smaller than their, than their parents, but still quite large. Yeah. Great question, guys. All right, Slade and Miss Ivestas wants to know, how do you get the funding to conduct your research? So when you're going out on these expeditions, who are you partnering with to make that possible? So it's a very creative process. So oftentimes we get grants from places like the National Science Foundation. So all of my Arctic work and my tuna work and the Antarctic stuff was all funded by the National Science Foundation, along with many of my other projects. This project is a little bit different. Um, so I have private funders. Um, as well as some companies sponsoring the work. I like when we get these questions. I mean, the world of science and exploration does rely on the goodwill and generosity of a lot of people and governments. NSF is, so the NSF that you mentioned is probably the principal science funder on this planet for a lot of cool expeditions. Yes, yeah, right. Antarctica, diving, any number of things around the globe, the NSF is behind it in the US and Canada, of course, has their equivalents as well. So uh, yeah, great question, guys. All right, Mr. Margaret, we're coming back to you, Natasha, after that, and we'll take a few more from you, too. Hey, guys. Hi there. I've got Bella here. Hey, Bella. Um, have you ever saw a squid fly a sperm whale, and do, you, and do they get hurt? Cool question. <laughs> so, I have not actually seen a squid fight a sperm whale, because that would happen at the extreme depths that we can't get to. I do, I would really love to go down in a submarine or use a remote operated vehicle to get down there to try to see that happen because that would be phenomenal. However, one thing that I have 
been very fortunate to see is a giant squid tentacle. So we were on one of our last drops of one of our trips. I was in the water about five big sperm whales and I noticed something coming out of one of its mouths and it was pretty cool. And I was like, hmm, what is that? And then as they all dove to go hunting again, it fell out of its mouth. And one of the younger whales that wasn't diving actually brought it up to the surface and it ended up being a 20 foot long giant squid tentacle. No way. And so here I was in the water with a newly killed, freshly killed giant squid tentacle that was completely still almost alive, even though it was detached from the body. And like it's got color cells and the color cells were actually still pulsing. And it was a, the suckers were attaching to me as I held it. And it was absolutely phenomenal. So that's the closest I've ever been to a giant squid or the hunt. Um, but it does seem for your other part of your question, it does seem that sometimes the whales do get, you know, maybe not like lethally hurt or, you know, from the giant squid, but they do have quite a few scars on them. So you'll see the squid, the circles from the suckers sort of from the squid um, and you'll see sc um, different scars. They're very scarred up. They have a lot of markings on the whales. So some of them probably do come from some sort of epic battle that happens down at depth, which I would love to see. So everybody would, I, to yeah. my knowledge, no one's ever seen this. Like we've never actually seen the fight, but I mean, truly to think about this for classes that might not know, like it's the most titanic battle that happens in the entire animal kingdom, period. Nothing comes close. Like you've Certainly got this one of monster squid with an eye the size of your head and like huge like spikes on its tentacles like 40 feet long versus like a 50 60 foot whale trying to eat it like i mean it's crazy to think about um anyway yeah. very yeah. cool no and, absolutely and but yeah it's pretty neat to think about the fact that in dominica there are giant squid there are also some smaller squids um that are still very big so and they're eating all of them but to think about we've seen pieces of giant squid and then we obviously got this tentacle and so to actually have that and be able to touch it and like be that close to a giant squid for me was one of the coolest things that's ever happened to my life if not the cool in my life if not the coolest so i mean i love every program we do but the ones where i my face hurts from smiling is always <laughs> a good sign i think uh, natasha we'll head back to you in belgium we'll take a few from youtube and, and time flies and you're having fun so we'll take a few more questions and wrap up from there mr mark Rick, i will come back to your student as well Hey, Natasha. <laughs> Hello. I was wondering how they process their food. I mean, they've only got uh, teeth in their lower jaws. So do they munch their food in some way or do they swallow those squids as a whole? Yeah. How exactly do they do that? So it does seem that they probably do swallow. I don't know because no one's ever really seen them um, eat you know, a huge giant squid. Now, Feisty in captivity was swallowing the smaller squid that they were feeding it whole. Um, so I think that I would probably swallow it whole. Now, however, you do see sort of like tentacles trailing out of the sperm whale mouth sometimes. So I think that, um, you know, as it sort of comes down, some pieces will break off. And then, you know, especially like the tentacles. Um, but I think that they mostly just swallow it whole. Yeah. Cool question, Natasha. All right, we're going to go back to Ms. Trini's class for a couple questions. By the way, uh, the, the names of kids that are asking questions today, you guys have like the coolest names of all time. Because I always get like, I mean, there's very traditional names. It's just very exciting. Um, <laughs> Leo wants to know, how sharp are their teeth? Quick one, simple. Oh, so they don't, they're not very sharp. Um, some of them are pointier than others. Um, but in general, it, they don't look very sharp. I've never touched one. I mean, I do actually have a old sperm whale tooth. I actually have two sperm whale teeth. Um, one is an old one that um, was my mother's that she actually got in Nantucket when she was a kid. So Nantucket was one of the, you know, the central points of whaling back in the 18 and early 1900s. Um, so I have a sperm whale tooth. Um, unfortunately, I don't have it with me, but it's quite blunt. Um, and then I also have a fossilized sperm whale tooth that someone gave me, and that one's pretty cool. But they're kind of more of a conical shape and not super pointy, but I have seen some that are pointy. Now, whenever I've been sort of like in the mouth of a sperm whale, which I have to say I've done quite a few times, um, they don't seem particularly sharp. Okay. Uh, Messiah wants to know a great question. What tools do you use to measure the whale? You're like, oh, a 30-foot whale. Like, how do you know that? 
<laughs> so it's largely from those photos that you'll see of like me next to the whale so that we can estimate the size. Now, of course, most of the numbers that I was giving you are like sort of the averages that we would like read about in a textbook. So if you were to Google a sperm whale, that's sort of what you would see. But if you look at me, like the first picture I showed me next to the whale, you can see I'm five foot three and then I have my fins. And so then you can sort of estimate from that, depending on how close I am to the whale, how big it would be. Okay. Um, and so that's sort of the way that you would do it in the wild as well as you would put something that's, you know, you would use something that you know the size and see. Um, and basically it's an estimate because, I mean, feisty obviously could be completely mm -hmm. measured because he was being handled, but in the wild, we're not really handling and you can't really get that close. You wouldn't want to get that close to the sperm whales. You want to give them their space. I think we're all a little disappointed that you don't have like a really big tape measure, but that's okay. And I think that is a very, uh, I think it would be really cool too. believe okay. me. Next yes. expedition. Yes. Um, Mr. Markwick, I know you're bringing in all the students that hadn't asked questions before, which is awesome. So we'll wrap up with one more from you guys. Come on in. I've got Jane here. Hi. Why do sperm whales sleep with their heads up? Yes. Cool. <laughs> So that's a really good question. And I'm going to admit to you that I've also seen them sleeping with their head down, oh. which was kind of mind blowing because I had never seen that before. Um, but on our last expedition, we were in the water with many sleeping whales and some were face down and some were face up. Now, the reason that I would think that they're facing straight face up and like we don't really know is sperm whales actually have one blowhole. Um, as opposed to many of the other baleen whales, because they're a toothed whale. So toothed whales have one blowhole and um, baleen whales, so like humpbacks and blue whales and fin whales have two blowholes. Um, and they have one, it's sort of like a left nostril, right? So it's kind of at the front of their head. And the other thing with sperm whales is that their blow is actually at 45 degrees as opposed to straight up and down. So as they're sort of swimming and you watch them, they kind of like bob up and down, oh, sleeping, sorry. They bob up and down to the surface. And it's probably a way that they can breathe so that they can sleep for more than 45 minutes or so. So they can like bob up, take like a little breath because they need to breathe like we do, um, and then sort of go down below the surface. So that's one of the theories as to why they might sleep vertically. Very cool. I like that very much. Um, Galen, this has been so, so much fun. I know we've got more questions than we can shake a stick at, but we are nearing the end of the broadcast. So what I want to do is bring up, again, the resources that you highlighted at the end of your talk. If people want to learn more about you, the film, get involved, learn more about your expeditions, galenrosenwax.com, so your name, if people want to check that out after the broadcast, or check you out on social media where you do so much great stuff, show you so many amazing pictures. I really encourage all our classes to check that out. And and I did mention it as a plug earlier, but if you guys want to be able to explore the oceans and you are young, Patty Bubble Maker Program is a great first start to get, uh, you know, on the way to becoming a scuba diver so you can explore and, and it, you know, have so much fun in these amazing ecosystems, see these creatures that Galen's got the chance to showcase today. It's a really, really special way of exploring the world. Galen, before we wrap up, uh, is there any final message about sperm whales or expeditions that you want to leave all our classes with today? Um, sure. Well, first, I would love to tell everybody, again, with those resources, if anybody has any more questions, because I know we had a limited time today, please feel free to send them to me either via social media or via my website. There's a little panel that you can um, send me an email, um, and I'm happy to answer them. Um, and otherwise, you know, I think just appreciate the ocean and learn as much as you can about it because it's absolutely amazing. And I think the thing that I love most about the ocean and nature in general is that I'm always learning something new. There's almost never a time that I go out in the ocean and I don't learn something new. So I just encourage, encourage everybody to be curious, um, whether it's something that you're looking at in your backyard or something in the ocean, um, because our natural world is just so spectacular. And there is always something that the nature is going to reveal to us and we can use that forever. So. What a beautiful message to leave with for our classes on YouTube, for our classes live. Thank you all so much for joining today. Uh, as you know, Galen, I'm going to bring in Natasha and Mr. Marker to join me in saying a thank you and farewell. So come on in, Mr. Marker's group especially. Have a